Yes, greetings and welcome to this episode of uh, the Diaspora Show on Civic Space TV. I am Philip Melissa. Uh, I want to welcome all of you colleagues on this episode. It's a very special episode where we talk about uh, very serious, very candid, very heart-touching uh, events that have happened in the country, but also across the borders from where I sit here in Kampala, Uganda, and uh, I know we're in different time zones, but I send you greetings. It's uh, an afternoon here, a very bright one for that matter, a very sunny one. I know some of you where you are, you might not have the privilege of looking at the sun at this point in time, but we have it here, but until in the country, a very beautiful country, Uganda, in terms of nature and the people. Of course, we can discuss the challenges that arise with management and a couple of other situations, but it remains a good country. I am Philip Melissa, and today we talk about a tragedy that befell our country near the capital city for that matter, the Chitezi garbage landfill that happened to slide and kill a, a number of citizens. As we speak today, 34 Ugandans died as a result of that incident. Uh, Police says they are looking approximately for 33 more individuals who they believe are still under the garbage down there. But also we have a series of individuals that were taken out of uh, the, the situation. About 15 are in hospital. Then we have hundreds that were displaced, lost their property and uh, animals, uh, chicken, cattle, goats and so on. So it's something we have to talk about as uh, a people who wish well for our country but, and we want to assess uh, what really caused the challenges, how we got here, but also how we can get out of there. And also later in the conversation, we look at having conversation about corruption and uh, a lot has been happening in this country about corruption, the protests, the arrests. And of course, recently we have uh, a couple of uh, communications we have tweets from uh, the cdf of this country talking about a series of things about corruption and we want to i want to pick your opinion on some of these conversations and uh, revelations we have in the country and later as we conclude the show i want us to talk about uh, across the border recently we had an election that was won by the incumbent his excellency paul kagame with uh, a rather surprising 99.15%. It's a rare occurrence that a vote is won at, at such a percentage that it happens. And uh, we had the inauguration a few days ago, so I want to pick your view on the entire electoral process, but also what you think of uh, the coming five years of uh, President Paul Kagame. Uh, as we get into that uh, detailed conversation in the next uh, about two hours, I will... Uh, invite you to briefly talk to us about your environment where you are bring us to speed about some of the things you we could know about your location since we're in very different locations uganda usa canada and wherever we are talk to us about your environment and what you think we can know about maybe the politics maybe the environment the the, the climate of where you are as we get into the conversation i'll start with the uh, honorable joseph ocheno Honorable, you're most welcome to the show. How are you and how is uh, you say you're in Kampala? How is uh, the part of Kampala you are in? Uh, thank you, Phil. I think it's unfair for you to start with me in Kampala <laughs> since you've just boasted that uh, uh, we're enjoying warm sunshine, uh, we're enjoying an afternoon, and you taunted mm -hmm. uh, your other guests that they're in places where they never see the sun, and if anything, some of them are just waking up. Uh, and so uh, that, that is rather unfair on their behalf. But from my perspective, I'm delighted to be here, Phil. Delighted to see you. Delighted to see my other colleagues. Uh, uh, I, I must put on record that your show has, uh, on a number of times, sought to have me uh, join you as I normally do once in a while. But on two mm -hmm. particular occasions, it was not possible, one, because of time, but two, because mm -hmm. I, I was totally committed elsewhere. But I think the third one was really because of network. And I think Miriam, one time, uh, I, we were on the show with you, I think all my other colleagues actually, and uh, the network was very, very bad. But at that time, I can't blame Kampala because I wasn't in Kampala either. So, uh, uh, rainy in Kampala, but it rained in Nagongra the day before yesterday where I was. Um, mm. We were struggling for rain in Nagongra, but there was more rain in town because Nagongra is 20 kilometers 
uh, east of uh, uh, west of Tororo, uh, uh, but more deeper towards uh, uh, Busolwe. Um, generally, people continue to struggle to see what UPE has uh, done for them, also to see any effect of uh, 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 PDM. Uh, but generally, people continue to, to, to leave. I must say that uh, yesterday morning, I visited Nagongre Health Facility, uh, and, and I saw, you know, the medical services, the medical officers doing their level best, you know, in, in to, 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 to serve their level best to uh, to deliver the very limited services that they could do for, for our peoples. I was delighted to, 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 to say that, uh, to say then and today again that, no, um, as Phil, you rightly say, this country belongs to us. This is a fantastic country. But also they've got, uh, we've got people who generally are committed to doing uh, uh, the work of trying to make this country possible for our children and children's ch children. And so therefore, it is also possible that even in Kitezi, there will be some, some, um, some, uh, some public figures, um, some, some public professionals, some ordinary citizens who would really be heroes of ours yesterday and heroes of ours today. And I'm sure even at Kampala City Council, there will have been some people in, you know, who, who, who saw some of these other things and committed themselves to doing the right thing. So as I said, I saw that in Nagongera. I must say also that, um, that say, um, I had a, what could easily have turned into a major accident, I'm saying this uh, formally, uh, uh, last week I had a, an accident, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. it was very bad because I roamed onto uh, uh, um, Maram that had been put in the middle of the road, you know, at 9.36 in the, in the night, but no signage had been placed in there. So these are minor issues, but um, that you'd expect some average construction worker to use their heads. You know, this you don't invoke Museveni, but I invoke Museveni because the environment in which many of these people would have been born and perhaps have grown. Uh, and so that was terrible. Interestingly, before my accident, um, hmm. two other border borders had uh, been involved in there. And one person I'm told was unconscious for over 30 minutes. These things go across our country uh, without being reported and be, without being... Honorable Joe, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yes. Please. So, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I saw that within the last five days after my incident, the construction workers, you know, started doing the right thing, putting, include putting silage and talking nicely to people. But it's a matter that I'm taking up uh, with the, the relevant authorities. But that was sort of my experience in the east. But uh, back here, I am delighted, as I say, to, to to join you guys, and as I said, our heartfelt condolences to people who who died and lost their loved ones, and to those others who are still, you know, wrapped under the garbage thanks to an incompetent authority of 40 years that cannot discuss and plan environmentally for securing our citizens at our national capital. Thank you, uh, Honorable Joe, for that uh, really detailed uh, introduction, and uh, did we say sorry for that accident you had, and we hope uh, that things are corrected from that particular part of the country. It is very important. I want to bring in... Uh, Mr. Albert Bakasara, Mr. greetings and uh, how is uh, your, your environment, but also s since you are near, we have uh, a story that is unfolding. The Ugandan ambassador to Canada is facing uh, a return to the country because of alleged misconduct in, on the streets of uh, Canada, there, is, there was an interaction between her and uh, NUP supporters that, that were protesting the disappearance of one of their security people. How is that unfolding and what can we know about it? Briefly, as you to talk to us about where you are. Yeah. Uh, Philip, greetings and uh, greetings my fellow panelists and greetings to the viewers. Um, Good question. So on the on, on the incident in, in, in Canada, I honestly have to tell you that I have the same information as you have uh, from the media. But on the broader, to talking to the broader point of that, it, it's really, it really says much about who we are uh, as Ugandans, mm. because the impunity that you're going to have in Kampala will not work in these countries. These countries, they're perfect. We, we live, I, I live in the States, I'm right here about 15 minutes away from uh, uh, the White House, but when we come, especially for the people who are posted in these places as ambassadors, 
Most of them are failed politicians. Others are here because of uh, patronage. Others are here because they know so and so. Definitely not career diplomats. For career diplomats, an incident like what happened in current Canada is impossible. But for these guys, the, it's, it's they politicize these embassies, they forget their mission, they even forget the con convention, uh, the, the Geneva Convention stipulations that govern them, and that's why they get in trouble. So that's what I want to say to that. Um, I even want to weave in uh, one of the topics you raised. You said you saw some tweets. I We're also seeing those the same tweets. I saw one concerning the work of uh, uh, the PC is it what you, what you call it the the one uh, headed by uh, the son-in-law of the president? Oh, uh, the, the, the president. The that is supposed to be promoting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is supposed to be promoting trade and investment, and uh, they were mm -hmm. here a few months ago talking about uh, about a go and all that. But I saw also the president's son tweet uh, about the same thing. So I imagine, because I've been here for a while, and they come here under uh, uh, diplomatic uh, auspices um, long ago. And I've been close to some of the diplomats who have been posted here. So I kind of understand their work and their mission in the context of what we're talking about in Canada. I can't imagine for the ambassador here or the ambassador in New York reading that tweet that can't make their job easy. You have a, a son-in-law son of, the, of your, the appointing authority visiting your area, promoting trade with Uganda. So as the ambassador on the ground, you're supposed to organize meetings, you're supposed to chaperone them around because, because these people don't live here. So you are literally the point person on the ground. So you do all that work. And then you see a tweet like that from the son of the appointing authority. So it's like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Okay? If you if, if, if you do all this, if you do your work well in promoting mm -hmm. Uganda's trade that is being advocated by the son-in-law, then you are not in the good graces of the son. <laughs> if you if yeah. it's the other way around, then... So, but this is a professional job. You're supposed to have a clear mandate, a clear definition of your job, and you do it well in the service of your country. But it's impossible. So that's to that broader uh, 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 question Thank about you. Canada. Thank you, Mr. Albert, for that uh, you know opinion about the, the unfoldings in Canada, and we wait to see how it continues to unfold. I've learned that uh, the ambassador will be coming back into the country on the 21st August or thereabout, and we hope things can be streamlined to see us be represented better internationally. I want to bring in Dr. Kot Ochen. Doctor, greetings and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, my salutations and uh, greetings to all the colleagues on the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's morning here. It's just uh, after five. And uh, just fresh from bed, <laughs> but uh, I'm good to go. Yeah, I must uh, say that uh, first I begin by maybe uh, conveying my um, condolences uh, to my fellow uh, compatriots and um, uh, back home who um, met, uh, you know, their fate because of um, bad mannered, uh, you know, uh, system and governance uh, back home in Uganda. I will talk more about that in the near course, the new course. And then uh, back here in Canada, I must say that uh, we're also getting towards uh, the federal elections that is uh, coming up. And then also the weather is uh, pretty good. Everybody is you know, enjoying the summer. And um, finally, about... Uh, our ambassador and my friend and sister, um. <laughs> I I just uh, you know say it's very unfortunate and um, I'm not very uh, surprised uh, you know 
she's a politician. She was once in the Congress, and then she left, and then uh, and she lost her colleague. Yes, a woman sit there, and then I think that's why she was and picked and um, sent there. So these are politicians. You know, these are politicians, and uh, they are there to do politics as opposed to you know being diplomats. So that's what I can say. So I think um, uh, as a person in Canada, you know, I've not been very uh, close to uh, the Ugandan uh, you know, embassy because of uh, multiple reasons. And, uh, but uh, it's unfortunate. I hope uh, this will be rectified uh, in the near future. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chin. And uh... Madam Miriam Chomgasho, you welcome to the show. Greetings. Hi, Phil, hi, panelists. Uh, ah, you said we don't have the sun, but it is summer and the sun is really shining, even hotter than in Kampala. So yeah. we have a bright sunny day, very hot, extra hot, but very nice. And um, and we are waiting for the Ugandans com uh, in North American convention, which is going to be in Albert's backyard in Washington, D.C. That's in the two weeks time. And that's when Ugandans gather together. We really uh, talk about issues, including development and the topics we are discussing here. Sometimes come up, sometimes they are crowded by the local politics as usual, but it's a moment to look forward to and um, have a talk. It's like we, we try to reconnect. And as Ugandans in diaspora, we really, we are also very eager to do something back home. We are eager to listen to people from Uganda if they have something good, something new. But sometimes the news are depressing and disappointing, like we see the incident in Ikitezi, which could have been avoided very avoided which was very unfortunate but like any other thing in Kampala it's gonna be rubbish it's gonna be pushed aside and life will go on as normal you know we we would been saying right uh a Ugandan a Ugandan life a life of a Ugandan is the cheapest right now in the world almost i mean it could be better off than those in gaza but still in kampala you lose your life and nobody is held accountable nobody cares and that's very unfortunate if it's not Chitezi, you saw the other incident where a party member because you are a different person or you are a different uh political believer from um, <coughs> excuse me from the uh, lead, uh, the, the leading party, you are NUP or any other opposition party, you are kidnapped, you are held, you are either beaten or you are killed, and nobody's going to be held accountable. So it's quite unfortunate. It's, it shouldn't be happening in 21st century. It's not like uh, we are living in medieval days, but it's unfortunate it's happening. And as for the ambassador, I think that this be a lesson uh, not only to the people who are delegated in these embassies and uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. I know uh, in a, it's NRM uh, regime's habit to send out failed politicians to the to diplomatic causes, but it should be a lesson to all of them to know where are you going and how do people behave in countries you are going to. You can't behave like you are in Bukedia when you are in Canada. These Western countries are a land of freedom, like they cherish freedom, uh, like life. So you can't stop people from protesting simply because you don't believe in whatever they're advocating for. You feel it's offensive to you. You just listen to them, whatever the case, everybody has a right to protest. So next time they send someone, <laughs> maybe they should brief them enough or maybe send like personal assistance and advise us to take them around the corners and uh, especially where the laws and uh, the legal arrangements are concerned so that they don't meet such a obstacles because they are embarrassing, not only to the people who appoint them, but also to us as a country. This is quite an embarrassment. How do you tell people that your ambassador was the one who was kicked out uh, because she didn't know what to do? So as for um, as for the rest, we'll be discussing as we go. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Miriam, for that. And uh, indeed, like you mentioned, we should have lessons for who and how we train our people that have to be sent for those uh, transnational missions that uh, represent us as a country, both in matters of economics, leadership, and so on. Uh, colleagues, as we speak, 34 Ugandans are confirmed dead, and uh, you have about 30 more that are suspected to be dead. You have uh, tens in hospitals, you have uh, hundreds displaced, you have uh, animals killed, property destroyed uh, as a result of a garbage landfill that uh, after heavy down power had to slide into human settlement areas around that particular place in Chitezi Kampala here along Gayaza Road, if you colleagues can remember details of Kampala and how the geography is. And it is a subject that everyone has discussed on their level. Some say it is uh, a question of negligence, others say it is a question of uh, an accident, others say a couple of schools of thoughts are, are on ground describing this particular incident. I want to, to start with you, Honorable Cheno, who is in Uganda, you see, you've been able to look at some of the of the activities as they unfold around this particular incident. You see, a week later, government is trying to look for these bodies of Ugandans. We have uh, the KCCA setting up a station where they are calling on Ugandans to donate to assist these people. What is your assessment of uh, the response of government after the occurrence of this disaster? Because it occurred anyway. What is your assessment of the response, Honorable Chairman? I feel this incident should not happen. It should not have happened. Uh, it certainly should not have happened this year because this is a matter that as long time ago as 2008, mm. as long time ago as 2008, this was a matter already critically an emergency and criti critically overdue their warnings and their documentations to that effect. And so it's extremely unfortunate. This uh, beautiful country of ours that we all love, <clears throat> uh, this beautiful country of ours that uh, there's some major media network in Uganda who call me the, the, the only optimist in UPC and the only optimist in this country. Uh, I want to suggest that Actually, I'm possibly not the only one because I talk to people in UPC and in this country. And I think uh, none of you would reject the idea that we are all optimists, at least on this panel. So this country is actually possible in future. The issue really is what we should do. Uh, and this country is one unfortunate, which is basically captured uh, in the last 40 years. And those are things that we need to be to, to address. And so therefore, these uh, uh, unfortunate tragedies basically a really reawakening for us to resolve uh, uh, to uh, um, rethink ourselves as individuals collectively as groups political organizations and communities and as citizens as we go on this panel to say that no i think we cannot continue and this way which takes me back very briefly to uh, something about uh, ruth uh, from canada um mm. because i think one of my slogans has always been that uh, this country is possible that all we need to do is to believe in better. And so therefore, mm -hmm. I'm just asking that Ugandans ought to believe in better. We just need to be re recognized that we are being shortchanged and been shortchanged for a long time. Now, I, I know Ruth, uh, and I'm sure, I think actually Ruth hosted Jim McKenna and I in 2005 or later thereabout uh, when we returned from Zambia and when we visited Lamo. Um, I need to know her at the time. Um, and so I think I've actually eaten in our house, uh, but also at the time, because we were then eminent party leaders, I'm sure L Ruth would have been very nice around me at the time, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so extremely disappointing that individuals like this uh, could be uh, present themselves in a manner in which they do and that they have in the name of the Republic of Uganda. But I want to say very deliberately, because I've already put the di on disclaimer that Sadly, though, as you guys hinted, uh, people who now end up serving NRA blindly, including people like Ruth, are not be surprised that their job, regardless of their thinking capacities, are desperate to please a man and please a man with his son and his son-in-law and please 
some family and they forget that they are serving the people of this country rather than serving some individual. So they want to sometimes want to sing louder than uh, the choir of heaven that would be singing for Comrade, our leader, Jesus. And that's basically what's happening. In terms of diplomatic etiquette and processes, and I think uh, uh, we've got to one of our panelists, somebody with a diplomatic background, but I'm sure all of us are familiar, that in any postings in major positions anyway, even if you're an average bank manager, you get an induction. But when it comes to the question of diplomacy, especially to be appointed as an ambassador, that is the president of a country in another country. So these are powerful positions. So in any case, these people get and should ideally get briefings from foreign, foreign, from the foreign office, foreign affairs, many ministers of foreign affairs, um, from diplomats and technocrats, uh, and including briefings from uh, their appointing authorities, in this case, their patronage minister at State House. But beyond that, when they are reaching rich Canada, or whatever areas of posting, the ambassador is the chief, but they should be technocrats there, minister councillors and other civil public servants who are trained career diplomats who ideally should advise these people what to do or not to do, including British and all those countries. In any case, these days, if some of them are not dubious P7 form 2 dropouts who now have masters and they, they run ministries, you know, they, mm. they, they should, these days, all you need to do is to Google the role of an ambassador and how diplomacy works without even a briefing, and you do it. So Ruth knows and has good capacity to know this, especially the fact that she spent some time in UPC, you know, uh, shamefully, unfortunately. You know, so she should have an idea. All I think that this beautiful lady is trying to do and was trying to do was to please a master that put, took her down there. And really, it's a shame, really, on the appointing authorities. And very, very sad that is somebody who's come from UPC uh, uh, to be able to behave like this. But anyway, it's not surprising that somebody who comes from UPC and thinks that Muslim Seven is the new heaven for them possibly talks about the personalities rather than the positions. But finally, I think mm -hmm. Miriam... Somebody talked about, um, um, again, uh, political appointees. It should not necessarily be. The last best ambassador to London was the Ugandan agent since independence, Shafika Rain, uh, whom I happen to have been glad to know. Ugandan, Ugandan Asian, top ambassador, but he was a top politician, so, too. He's one of those people who told me that as well as 1979-80, they're thinking strategically about the elections of that of 1980, including... He said one of those people who predicted averagely what kind of the number of seats that UPC would win. He went to London and served as an ambassador. So it's possible for non-career diplomats to serve well. It just simply matters who these individuals are, you know, what the environment are and what the systems that they're serving are. So it's really a shame. But anyway, so back to this, though. Um, because, as I said, that this is a matter that had been known earlier. Um, it should not have happened. But now that it's happened, what does it tell us? Phil, I don't know whether you know that you, you Kampala is the most, I think that's the recent information, I don't know about the last 12 months, but at the last I had was the most polluted capital city in the world. Meaning the mess in garbage, mess in the town planning, mess in city planning, but mess in national planning. I've just told you that I survived narrowly all the way near Tororo on a road simply because somebody had basically failed to do what they're supposed to do or they kept of doing what commonsensically they needed to do on uh, public health and safety in on the road you know so here mr Museveni can go and shout and shout and shout and present as if he's giving them a, a money from rakitura or five million sugar uganda shoes which i think is a peanut which is an insult to these people anyway but those are public money money is going to people who uh, survived Kitesa should not come from State House. Money is going to people Kitesa should be either supported via KCC, which is still public money anyway, or indeed via respective ministries. And, and so it tells you really how confused and confusing we are as a country. Uh, finally, I think though, um, whereas we just suggested that maybe 30 more people are still awaited, we are, may still, still, are still unaccounted for. We don't know how many other people were injured and how many other extended families are and how much other damage to property has taken place. This is something that should require an investigation rather than sending a deputy uh, is inspector general of government, whatever those positions are. A future UPC government would, will, will actually dissolve this nonsense about inspector of government because we never had it. And so, time has shown that we don't need it. We need to mobilize public resources to go to respective positions, train people, 
make sure that when you're in us, you do your job is to be in us, and we're an environmental officer, environment officer, we pay you, you do the job, and you do the job nicely, and you respond, you're responsible, and you're calm. Thank you, uh, Honorable Channel, for that uh, detailed submission. I want to bring in uh, Mr. Albert here. Albert, we have uh, a station in the country where anything between 2,000 and 3,000 uh, tons of solid waste is dumped on a day, on a daily, and uh, there is no plan whatsoever to see that this solid is uh, going to be maybe shifted in this way or managed in this particular way to see that it does not continue to pile and pile without uh, an end. What does that say about, uh, one, the, the people in charge of uh, managing the city, uh, especially at a time when we're mourning uh, over 30 deaths? Thank you for the question, uh, Philip. And again, um, uh, really, it's a tragedy, and you've called it rightly, because this is something that should not be happening. Uh, my heart really breaks for, for the families that are going through this. Uh, the loss of property, the lives that have been changed forever. It's really sad. Um, we're not the first city uh, to, 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 to manage uh, piles and piles of garbage. This is not rocket science. Uh, see, our politicians, and, and even us as uh, the, the governed, when we talk about these things, especially us, when we talk about these things, people say, oh, America has taken this long to, to, to develop. UK has taken this long to, 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 to get where they are. Mm. But we are also selective when we're doing those things. Museveni has not waited, or Uganda has not waited for centuries for the president to get a, a jet they have not <laughs> they have not waited <laughs> for centuries to live in palaces but when it comes to simple service delivery like garbage collection say oh these are institutional problems we're still developing as a country but look we've constructed a road here they divert and deflect and all, and, and all that honestly this is not rocket science okay fund the priorities, I mean, the funding that is happening right now also tells on the priorities of the government. From the soldiers sleeping in uh, Mama Ingia Pole with uh, a gun that costs about 15 times their salary, <laughs> but they have no housing, they're paying, the open sewers running through their camps. It, it's what you value. But then you go and buy a gun that could build a school from land cruisers that one of them could be could actually elevate the, the, the suffering that we saw with those people buried in, in, in garbage. Just one land cruiser, a hundred thousand mm. dollars, a hundred thousand dollars could actually do a fence around that thing and say, no, 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 you guys can't encroach. And if it's full, it's full or a barrier. Or just close the thing and open space somewhere else. So, what do we do going forward? Our people, and here I want to also call to task the opposition, because they've been managers of Kampala to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I'm used to the politics here in, in the U.S., but if you're part of the system, even though you're in the opposition, if it's not working, it's incumbent upon you to raise the alarm. And if everything fails, then you shouldn't be there. You cannot sit as the mayor and just collect a salary and say, oh, State House has not uh, allocated this money or the government has not funded it. You're part of the government. So this is not just on the NRM, at least in my humble opinion, it shouldn't be. It should be, we should task both the NRM government and the, opposi the po opposition politicians who have been managing or mismanaging Kampala, uh, the, the city, for, for, for this long. This thing should have been closed. I think it was uh, uh, selected to be closed in 2015. Why is it still mm -hmm. open? And yes, our people, our 60 people uh, are still, 30 have been recovered and 30 are still missing. But really, 
we're just counting at the people who died in one day. If you think about that garbage dump being there in pros, uh, close proximity to people, people's houses, now mm. imagine how many kids in that neighborhood have died of the diseases originating from that dump. Countless. No one is counting. But I, I want to say they're way more than 60. But no one has been counting over the years. So I think Miriam said earlier that we are our, our lives, the lives of Ugandans are very cheap. They really are indeed. And uh, Honorable, I, I feel sorry um, and, and um, I sympathize with you and uh, about your ex-accident and I'm glad you survived it. And But really, this is the life of Ugandans on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like survival. It's like the, the, the show here in America, they call it survival, and I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's really survival. Every day somebody gets up, they don't know whether they, even if they're just walking down the street, there's a, some, a, a negligence aspect of that walk that could cost them their lives. And nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So we need to be better. Our leaders have to be better. And even us, the government, have to really keep tasking, especially you, the youth. Some of us are getting old. This is your country. You have to demand accountability. We can just sit and then talk about these uh, tragedies when they happen, when they could well be avoided. I'll stop there for Thank now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Albert. It's indeed painful, like you mentioned. Andrew, Dr. Court, you see, you have uh, 30 people dead, 34 to be exact. You have a prediction of about 33 there is no account of uh, how much has been lost in terms of money, the property, the houses. Actually, government until now cannot tell us how many houses were destroyed. They are running on a prediction by uh, the local council chairman at a time when we just had the population census. And they say they had, uh, you know, perfect and uh, very correct figures. What does that say about how we manage our systems, but also how do we try to improve this situation? Thanks, uh, Phil. Uh, firstly, uh, once again, uh, permit me to you know convey my condolences to the families and the friends and uh, fellow countrymen and women you know who perished in that uh, tragedy. Very mm -hmm. sad, and uh, I must say that you know from hearing and reading and watching the news, you know, is a clear indicator that uh, our system of governance and management has completely uh, shattered or failed, you know. Uh, I can speak to this from um, my previous uh, professional background. Uh, my first, uh, you know, trainings were in environmental management and technology. I must say that uh, I was among the first bunch of uh, students to be enrolled in my career for environmental management in the late 90s is when they introduced uh, BA in environmental management, BA in, in uh, urban planning, BA in, in uh, developmental studies, that was 1997, 98, where the first lot, um, uh, the first graduates came out in uh, 2000, 2001 of that group. Mm -hmm. So I can say, yeah, I did uh, some work with NEMA in the past. And um, I also kind of uh, had a slight uh, interaction with uh, individuals at uh, you know, where this uh, uh, Chitezi, you know, landfill, of colleagues who did some uh, research work. And at uh, that time, there was, uh, I think, the Uganda uh, Uganda National Environmental Professional Body. It was very vibrant. I don't see them right now, you know, also active. And these are clear testimony that uh, we don't have uh, a vibrant uh, uh, civic or civil society, you know, because the professional bodies like, uh, you know, environmental professionals and uh, natural source uh, management you know it also been there to give a hand they are kind of slow down because that means there are no fundings okay uh the governance system has been shattered whereby there are no institutions okay his excellency uh general Museveni is the institution you know as i told you before is the judiciary is the parliament you know is the executive and then uh, he can uh, create any other commissions as he wishes, you know. Neymar example has been there for you know, for years, and as a student, 
I did some work there too, but I can tell you in the past, uh, Neymar was empowered, but I don't think of late and what they're doing is one thing. In other developed countries, when there are this kind of uh, tragedies, they will be clear, you know, kind of government uh, intervention uh, plans and methods on how to rescue the survivors and how to support, uh, you know, those who have kind of uh, perished, their families and the injured. But I don't see anything very, you know, very uh, prolific or effectively being uh, done to do that. So this is a clear testimony that, uh, you know, our system of uh, governance and management is wanting, has been kind of compromised. Uh, you wonder on earth, how do our kind of uh, citizens or our environmental settings reach this level, okay? Because uh, a country like Uganda, I know we have a pool of uh, professionals like environmental scientists, uh, environmental managers, natural resource managers, you know, we make sure, and I know they do they try to do their jobs. I know that uh, I talk to my old schoolmates, university mates. They are, some are professors, uh, doctors in that field. They're conducting always environmental impact assessment. They're always making environmental in, you know, impact reports. They're always uh, presenting papers on conservation and protection of uh, different, um, you know, kind of uh, fragile ecosystems, you know, within Kampala and of Kampala, you know, like in Mount Elgon, in um, Bale, about landslides and so on. They do that, okay? So I would say as a country, we have the information, we have the expertise, we have the human resources, you know, but uh, the people of Uganda are being let down by, you know, uh, the people in power. Know, who control the resources. You know, you might have brilliant, good ideas, the excellent ideas, excellent uh, policies or frameworks on how to address certain things. But because of uh, lack of support, lack of political will, you're doomed. Okay, so it's a clear testament of a failed leadership in the country. Wow. Thank you. I, I want to, uh, Mr. Chongasho, you see, when you listen to Dr. Kot here, he tells us we have the information, and of course, Honorable Cheno talked about it a little earlier, that we have the information, but the leadership seems not concerned about making sure this information is used to the benefit of uh, the country, the citizen, in terms of progress. Why would uh, a government or a system not be interested in making sure it delivers for its people? I think when a system is broken, whether it's interested or not, does it have capacity to do anything? Uh, the NRM government, all systems are ideally like not functioning well. So the information came, I had uh, even the, 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 the person in charge of public health in KCCA warned the and presented a report to the KCCA ED one month ago that there is a disaster pending at that landfill if nothing is being done. But you ask her what did she do about it? And um Uchiano said that the notices were given as far as 2008. There was a really comprehensive report in 2015. But even as 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 recent as last month, that was July, and I think the, there was another warning that the disaster is pending at that landfill if nothing is being done. But that's Uganda. I mean, um, anybody who knows Uganda, anybody who knows our NLM government wouldn't be surprised. But I think what is a real big uh, uh, challenge at KCCA it, uh, is um giving the authority i think like two parallel power points so the elected people who are politicians the council the lord mayor and the councillors are kind of like a parallel end to the authority directors who are appointed by the government and then the minister there is a disconnection so you, you hear the mayor and the Lord Mayor and the councillor saying, we talked about this, we warned you about ABCD, 
but then the authority which controls the budget which has the money which makes uh, would make alarms in case of emergency is the one sitting on the staff or maybe who is very which is very slow to react and uh, save the people but in any case why would there still be that kind of if you have ever been through uh days if you've ever passed that place why would you be uh, having such a mountain of a landfill uh what would why would you be having such a mountain of garbage amid this a residential area so people were living in the garbage practically i mean like the uh, like albert said this was a human disaster even if there was no sliding and and the accident that caused the destruction of property that killed the people. Why would people live in amid such a garbage, a garbage which would cause diseases? That would be anything. Anything is possible in such a um, unprotected uh, garbage area. And the the families, the residents. If KCCA was managing the place, you even wonder who allowed people to build so close to the garbage disposal. Is it the garbage disposal which entered into a residential community? Is it the people who entered into a garbage disposal area? Like it was too close and uncomfortable already, but nobody was doing anything. So even if there was no slides or whatever, it was already a disaster and 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 still nobody was doing anything even warnings were there and nobody was doing something but again i want to speak at a bigger challenge uh, which we have as ugandans if you live in kampala i'm sure you've noticed that we really have a problem of garbage disposal we don't even have recycling plants we don't have um okay of recent they are putting up like a few garbage cans in the public areas but still some garbage places some places can have garbage for days before it's being picked up and then it's yes, that's true. if you go near places like markets like Karera, you even wonder why people how people even buy food from such a such a place which is so messed up which is Either it's like garbage is mixing with the uh, with the uh, normal food, like you can't even make a separation of what is garbage and what is food, and the people are everywhere. The well, um, I mean, it's it's worrying, and and we can do better. That's what wow. is a challenge. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Miriam, for that uh, submission. Honorable uh, Cheno, you see, one of the things we have to talk about on this show is corruption and. Uh, if I try to link the corruption and the tragedy we had uh, a couple of days ago, see, we have uh, a series of uh, institutions, uh, agencies that are supposed to be managing things related to garbage. Look, they told us there is a budget of about 4 billion shillings at the ministry that is supposed to be overseeing this particular site alone. And... Uh, the report we, that was presented by KCC says that actually nothing had ever been used in terms of making sure this place is maintained or garbage is treated in a particular way to see that uh, the decomposable material is put in a different location and the plastic and so on. But also we have agencies like uh, KCCA that has a duty directly to make sure this place is okay. You have the Minister of Health that should be on ground to assess the health impact of such a space. You have uh, the Ministry of Disaster that should be making assessments to tell Ugandans that, oh, actually, when you are here, you are at the risk of A and B and C. You have uh, the Ministry of Environment, a couple of agencies in the country. Why do we find ourselves in crisis situations when we have... Uh, individuals and institutions that are budgeted for every year to make sure we're not in these particular positions. It's a leadership crisis, that simple. It's merely that we are being ruled rather than led. Um, and this is not making it simplistically political because it's a political issue anyway. Uh, it's a governance question. And part Miriam has suggested and think so did, I think, Comrade Albert. I think, you know, this is what we're saying. If you are at the helm of governance in the Republic of Uganda, you know, you take 100% full responsibility. Although I totally agree and I suggested that KCC also too holds to take responsibility. And so therefore, as the nuances of my good friend, 
uh, 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 Adas Lukwago and team and whichever other political organizations manage cases here. I told, I gave a joke, but it was a serious joke, I think, about 12 years ago, that I actively considered running for the mayorship of Kampala, and that in the event that I was a mayor of Kampala, you'd see a, a republic within a republic operating and functioning. Uh, uh, and, and I'm still not particularly joking. Uh, the day before yesterday, I was in Toro Town, going through a senior mm -hmm. quarters, and we're talking crude potholes in an up part, market part of Tororo. And the Tororo is one of the ones with the worst infrastructure in the country amongst them. Um, one of the people whom I had in the car said they couldn't understand how it would be. And I told them that had there been a UPC administration in Tororo, merely at a local council, and I'm not joking again, you know, these things would not happen. So yes, it is also true that while the mess starts from the State House in Tebe, it's absolutely also the responsibility for the people who manage Kampala City Council. We know, anyway, they've been held hostage. Mr. Museveni, typically, after we had an, an executive a mayor position in Kampala to manage and govern Kampala on behalf of those people who would have elected them, Mr. Museveni came and created a dubious position for his patronage, so-called Nyongo Nyongo Minister for Kampala. Maybe at this stage, we should also begin to carry out an audit talking corruption of how much the Minister for Kampala is costing the citizens of the Republic of Uganda and the citizens of Kampala, and how much that money possibly would go on to sorting out the, the infrastructure mess in Kampala. The portholes, the swimming uh, portholes of Kampala, the garbage stuff that uh, Miriam is talking about, and so are uh, possibly even the local institutions and schools there. Absolutely right. There is no way in which you would say that um, a normal functioning government and perhaps a normal functioning local authority people should have been allowed to construct them there. I'll tell you, I keep referring to these things, but usually very deliberately because for the record, uh, on the record, when I first returned from exile, uh, one of my first few interviews, uh, hosted actually, I think, by Andrew Mwenda and KFM at the time, when I was talking about the mess in Kampala, I remember a friend of mine, a journalist, fantastic, beautiful lady, I think she gets, should get be listening. And she told me that, oh, Joseph, you know, be careful, you know, you know, uh, that people don't take you that uh, you, you, you're presenting yourself as uh, somebody who's out of touch, you know, talking London and Johannesburg and forgetting Kampala. And I said, no, that is an absolute nonsense. I had returned to Kampala via Lusaka. And Lusaka is not traditionally the glorious place those days that would compare with Kampala. In fact, possibly not even Dar es Salaam, although Dar es Salaam was larger per population. But no, it was simply because I, I told the program that around K in KFM, industrial area that we had actively planned as a government of UPC, and indeed, in fact, the colonial governments had done some of those works already, you know, was now a slum. And then I remember reminding Andrew Mwenda that below KFM, there's a rail station, that a rail, rail line that goes down there, and it now looks like a crooked snake. You know, so we can go on and on. I had suggested that, well, the issue then is generally about planning. The issue also is about taking responsibility, which is point number two, which you, you, you refer to, this corruption thing. I suggest, and I'm going to demand, and I'm going to continue pushing this since I have a political heart, uh, that people take responsibility, that our friends in the Kampala City Council take responsibility, and Museveni's dubious minister for Kampala takes responsibility, and so does Mr. Museveni as the chief executive of the Republic of Uganda. Do you know mm -hmm. most of the people who are, ho whom we are hosting today, my other three colleagues would agree, even to in other countries, this is not the conversation we'll be having. We'll be take, to talk about the conversation. How many people have resigned? How many people have been sacked? What kind of inquiry is going to be taking place? And who's going to take the final big stick uh, responsibility? Maybe that is the line we need to be taking going forward. So there should be arrests, you know, and there should be, you know, people taking responsibility for this. But in any case, I think also, as I said, um, environmental pollution question in Kampala, when I was hinting much earlier that Kampala is the worst, in, in, in the group, it, it is, oh, unless they tell us something else uh, which is different. But I want to conclude on this on particular one. I rejected Museveni in 1980. Mm. I was a young, fantastic student. I rejected him, and normally talk about this. Thing. But one of the reasons why I rejected Museveni at the time was because I had the privilege as a young uh, boy turning 18, you know, listening to Museveni of uh, NRE UPM at the time and of DP, Dr. Semogere, and uh, of UPC. Dr. Oboti. In terms of the issues these guys were raising, you know, for us as then students, it was very clear, of course, that UPC was, and of course it is, and it's the future. But it was also very clearly the case 
that Museveni was fighting a program, including this continuous thing of wanting to militarize Ugandans. And even as young students, we saw it at the time that this guy did not have a national agenda, but it had a dubious agenda. And the dubious agenda has been confirmed. But finally, do you know why? One of the reasons why Museveni lost many, many students in Mira at the time was because he said that, um, uh, you know, um, these things are here. This is a kawadang. This is a kawadang here. Kawadang. You know, you can get, get, get energy out of it. And that they would do it if NRA came to power, meaning his UPM came to power. But mm. the reason was that he was showing us, Bosoka College, Mira students, the national institution, showing, trying to show us where cow dung comes from cows. And students were laughing, but this was actually quite, uh, quite an embarrassing thing, I'm sure, <laughs> particularly our team leaders there, including Rugunda, Dr. Rugunda, who was our senior OP, whom we're shouting, who was there. <laughs> this guy is showing us where cow dung comes from. So when he left, <laughs> students were saying, this guy thinks he's talking to Miri, Miri primary kids. He's talking to <laughs> so college Miri students. He's trying to show us where cow dung comes. <laughs> no, my grandson <laughs> does know that. And he's just, uh, he's just about to keep fine. Thank you. If that is the man of the time, Phil, if that is the man of the time, he takes reign of this country and we've got this stuff, we should not be killing our people, but should be a source of energy. Today, you're absolutely lucky that you've had me for the last nearly 40 years without power cut. It's an extraordinary mess. By any Mr. Museveni takes responsibility. It's a shame. Thank you so much, Honorable Chino, for that uh, detailed uh, overview of that particular situation. And you raised something so important that I want to address to Mr. Bakarasa Albert. You see, we have, uh, as we speak, a couple of Ugandans who are in prisons on, uh, on allegations of corruption. You have young people who came out a few weeks ago to go to the streets to demonstrate against corruption. You have uh, very many people that have been handpicked for their comments on corruption in the country. And uh, here you have a situation that has led to the death of uh, tens of Ugandans due to negligence. Property has been lost and uh, you don't have a reaction from government. People are still in their offices. Everyone is pointing a finger to the other and uh, at the end of the day, they are going to keep these offices, they keep getting their salary, no sanction whatsoever. How should uh, such a situation be handled in terms of legalese and, uh, of course, morally as a country? Uh, well, m morally is going to be uh, an, an, an uphill journey because the, the culture has really, of Uganda has really changed. Um, but Miriam did say that it was a crisis in, govern in, in governance. Corruption, for, for, for example, and we all have heard this, uh, co corruption is a crime of opportunity. Corruption happens everywhere, even here in the, in the U.S. Corruption is there. It's not, it, so the issue is not corruption. It's the level and the impunity. Those are really the variables that change, but corruption is everywhere. Uh, here in, 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 the, in the U.S., uh, we're, we're coming out of COVID, uh, the government passed the American uh, um, Recovery Act up, mm -hmm. and uh, money was being sent to businesses. So if you had a business, they wanted the government wanted you to keep your employees on the payroll so you don't fire and, and worsen the unemployment uh, situation at the time. Mm. And a whole bunch of dubious companies popped up in the middle of the night, filled up their paperwork and got billions, not millions, billions of dollars, fortunately. And to this day, and even I don't believe that some of that money will ever be recovered. Yes, some a few people have been caught and put the money, some they could trace. The government actually doesn't even have the capability to chase after everybody who took money fortunately through up. But you can see how it happened. That, that the corruption there, you can see it. The government wanted money out of the door very quickly. There were once in a lifetime pandemic was happening. There were no guardrails. But we're now back to, to, to normal. And the guardrails are back on. So that corruption channel has been closed. In Uganda, it's different. It's like people do not learn. Even the government itself, the government, it's, it's been the same president for almost 40 years. So there has there should have been lessons that he learns in the job. 
It can't be one scandal after another. It can't be people stealing the same way they've stolen since 10, 15 years ago. You close the loophole. So, again, corruption is a crime of, <laughs> of opportunity. Close the opportunity. Mr. Albert, could it be that maybe it, th that loophole is intentionally not closed? Oh, that's where I'm, that, that's what really where, where I'm heading. I'm just telling you that you have corruption in Uganda because the people who are in charge have a benefit. And that benefit could be personal, it could be tribal, it could be uh, whatever it is. There, there's a benefit of why they want the country or the country's institutions to fail the way they are failing. This, in my humble opinion, and maybe one day they'll call me to task on it. In my humble opinion, what is happening in Uganda is not by accident, it's by design. Because honestly, in this global economy, in this global environment, there is no, there isn't knowledge out there that is hidden away from our Ugandan leaders. None. The same things that were happening, they come here, but most of them come here. Uh, the, the owner was telling you he, he traveled the world. So if he was the mayor of some city <laughs> and he's, he's doing these things as if he's never been on a plane, it's, it has to be intentional. There's no other way for some of us to rationally look at it differently. That whatever is happening in Uganda is happening intentionally. Now, can we end it? Yeah, no. But some of us, and, and this is one of the reasons why I wake up and uh, a, a little bit early and get on shows like this, because I really think that by having these conversations, we do, maybe somebody would land on this step or some, someone will hear something out of this conversation that they say, you know what, we have to wake up. We have to wake up. We have to treat each other better, differently. We have to value our brothers, our sisters. You cannot honestly, you cannot honestly drive your land cruisers and watch the suffering of the people of Ketesi right now and go home and go to Serena Hotel and treat your family to a meal. I, I usually joke with my friends that I can't be God. <laughs> I cannot be God because if it was God, oh my God, the, 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 the punishment, your stomach, <laughs> would, your stomach that night when you pass through the tears in your land cruiser <laughs> and you go and have a meal and milk. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Be because honestly, because you have to be, you, we have to be fair to each other. We have to treat each other differently. This is the only place we have. We all have a stake in it. I don't know how we can appeal to the powers that be. All I can tell them, this is not sustainable. At some point, the deck of cards will fall. We all know that. <laughs> but we're praying Thank you. That, mm -hmm. that they have a different, they have, a, a, I don't know what I can call it, a reawakening. And so, you know what? Okay. Enough is enough. We're going to do some things differently. Thank you. Thank you, me. Mr. Albert, for, uh, for, for that. And uh, Dr. Court, I know you listened to that uh, quite candidly. And uh, of course, Mr. Albert here tells us he indeed can't be good. I don't know, maybe Ugandans have chosen to be God in some way or the other. But look, we have uh, a series of scandals in the country. Like he mentioned, you can't take a week without... Uh, another scandal unfolding in the country and uh, just yesterday i, I was uh, going through the x platform and uh, a, a tweet on the x hand of the chief of defense forces of the country among the many tweets uh whether you call them x posts or something like that uh he says one of the member of the members of parliament that is in prison as we speak is there because of uh, political reasons yet there is evidence that was even presented in courts of law that this member of parliament actually swindled money that was meant for co for cooperatives in this country and if the cdf is uh, able to say that and he continued to say 
the president should listen to him and uh, have this person released but also he continued to, he talked to the president that uh, he is actually sitting with other more corrupt people in his cabinet and there is another tweet that had the president having a conversation with uh, his his uh, son in law mr Audrey Prabogo, and he said this is one of the most corrupt people in your government and you're having conversations with them but you are arresting other people and i don't know what image, what do you pick from such unfoldings in there? Because this is the topmost level of the country. If you see things happening this way, what does it tell you about uh, the entire system? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you no, know, it's just very clear, you know. You don't have to be a very sharp uh, shooter or stone thrower. No, it's like throwing... Um, stone into Lake Victoria, you won't miss it. Yeah, the writings are very clear on the wall uh, that um, as a country, we're in a very kind of uh, very interesting um, uh, kind of untested or chartered uh, territories, you know, whereby you can see uh, before, you have never witnessed this in the history of Uganda, whereby uh, the son of the head of state is the CDF, okay? This is the first in the history of Uganda, and uh, there are no any other kind of um, what to use as kind of uh, citations or references, you know, for him to work, you know? So there's a clear mm -hmm. uh, conflict of interest and contradiction, whereby he comes in as uh, a member of the first uh, family, as firstly. Secondly, uh, this gentleman uh, mk is also you know a serving uh, military officer you know and thirdly he's a politician and fourthly he has already a political platform that uh, you know is using so i'm not surprised that uh, is coming out uh, to kind of uh, sanitize one of the you know the MPs or individuals who have been uh, maybe arrested you know, who's in jail already, okay? Who has been kind of uh, pointed to have been uh, engaged in corrupt uh, tendencies. Why? I guess it's his follower, you know? So it's contradicting. And I think also within the first family, there's also conflict. Mm. There's also conflict, you know? Uh, I think his brother-in-law and himself they're all trying to position themselves, you know, in uh, succession race. They want to succeed. They are head of their family. So the two uh, families, are actually, the Indo, the Moko, and the other brother, they're all actually battling, you know, take over from Muse in the, in the long run. Because they believe that it's a family affair in, in Uganda should remain within the household of Kaguta. That is there too, that's the misconception they're having. So if anybody else in any functioning democracy, if you make such a statement, there will be very severe, you know, consequences. You know, firstly, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the, the CDF should not be, be relieved of its duties, you know, by law is actually contravening the constitution. If you're in the you're in the serving, you know, military officer, you should not actually be commenting, you know, on sensitive political affairs issues in the country, you know. So this is a clear testimony that uh, our country has been invented by the dogs. That's my perception. But my former uh, leader, when I was the UPC, uh, the little Bote, once said the okay uh, that uh, the dogs. That the country that go to the dogs, you know, but the dogs have not invaded the country otherwise. So it's just a kind of a, a messed up uh, situation. I would never have seen like in uh, whether Canada, whereby you know, head of a military uh, institution would uh, go on um, social media and make such uh, very controversial and uh, sensitive uh, statements and could still be serving even other countries like, like Rwanda, 
you know, Rwanda might be having, you know, some issues, but uh, I think also the government of uh, Kagame and RPF, they're very, very heavy handed if it comes to some uh, issues concerning, you know, the military and their discipline, you know. Even in Kenya, you never see a serving you know, uh, military officer engaging in such kind of uh, utterance. Even in Tanzania, you will never see. Even the most backward uh, and maybe a little bit uh, low, the profile, low profile like uh, so Southern Sudan, even the, the generals hardly engage in uh, social media. I see the civil society uh, very involved, the politicians, yes. I haven't seen generals and uh, army officers, you know, very much involved in that, even in a more war-torn and very kind of fragile state like uh, the newly established Southern Sudan. So what is happening out there is a clear testimony that we have a shattered, you know, uh, country, there are no functional institutions, the institutions are kind of around one man, as I told you before. Museveni is the judiciary, is the, you know, parliament, is the executive, and other things, the military, everything. So, that explains. Well, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Yongasho, you see, the tweeting general, he tweets about corruption. Uh, when you read uh, some of the, the most recent tweets on his platform, he talks about how he's now requesting for a Twitter space with uh, President Trump and Elon Musk to teach them about Africa and the politics here. He's tweeting about corruption. He's tweeting about uh, uh, Egypt. And in the midst of all that, you have Ugandans that are in prison for doing the same exact things. Oh, what is your comment on that? I think uh, the biggest challenge is, or our problem is that we follow such a stupid tweets. Why are we even discussing them? And he is the CDF. He is the CDF, yes. But over time, he has proved himself to be a public nuisance, especially on that space. I mean, I'm not shying out to say that. So as a country, I mean, the appointing authority could be having his own reasons why he can't discipline him or put him to order. I've never seen any office of such a rank uttering such a nonsense. If you are a CDF and you know someone is arrested for corruption, you wait for the judiciary, for the legal process to take its course. That's how officers work. And especially military officers who follow the law strictly. So if he's a CDF and he's uh, uh, still uh, putting all his such a nonsense over the public space, I mean, his tweets are not official, um, official communication uh, channels, but still the, the code of conduct, the ethics, the, there is a certain decorum you are supposed to be treating it, taking yourself as a public servant. Uh, so I think I, uh, Whatever he says is, um, I mean, is total rubbish, but still and becoming an unprofessional. And whenever I see such a tweet, I, 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 my mind goes to the appointing authority and anybody supposed to be supervising such an office. Why do you still have such a nuisance in office, especially public office, which is paid for by a taxpayer's uh, uh, money? We can use a better person. We can use a person who is sensible and who is tweeting uh, things which uh, serve public interest. As for him supporting a corrupt official, by the way, the Honorable Mawanda is my MP. And if you know that guy, if you really know that guy, even before he became an MP, you wouldn't be wondering why he's in prison. That's where he belongs. I don't know how wow. he even voted. I mean, I'm not shy to say that, and I can prove it. Everybody knows when he was arrested in India, what had happened. Wow. So thank you for as, that. Uh, uh, as for as for the the CDF and whatever his brother in law and all that trash, I think it's a note to us as Ugandans that it is time such a people leave our offices. His brothers that put it that way. Uh honorable Chen, you see I know you have uh, lots of reservations about this tweeting, you know, but kindly, one of the things he keeps talking about is the the and um, the everlasting and uninterrupted and uh, the strength of the UPDF and the the Rwanda 
and defense forces and the RP and the, his uncle Paul Kagame received by Egypt Field Marshal LCC. What is your reaction to the unfoldings around the general and uh, of course the, the interaction between the countries? Miriam really has said it all except where I totally agree with you is that uh, because unfortunately he holds the official position of uh, a CDF of my country but it's really mm. the CDF of his father, on behalf of his father, and their agenda, the 40-year-old agenda. Um, mm. We are concerned because they are occupying us and they're controlling us. And the fact that he's appointed a CDF uh, when maybe he was with the, uh, the generation of Dr. Chen's in Makere, uh, and uh, maybe he was, uh, I don't know what his academic profile then was. Some of these things are neither here nor there. It's just a misfortune, actually. It's a tragedy. It's actually a tragedy to discuss this boy um, in a side by side with discussing another national tragedy, which is basically the Kitesi uh, 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 um, uh, tragedy, and but also side by side with what uh, is going on around Kampala today, and what I saw between Kampala and Nagongera and, and Tororo in the last just several days. This country is uh, being held hostage by a family. I think the issue is not about what Muhozi and his father and his uncle and his brother-in-law and his mother may be planning and deploying. They are doing it anyway. They're actively, destructively uh, seeking to consolidate their rule and hope that my Jesus will um, uh, sink the heads of Uganda's father and begin to call him a prince. You know, but uh, thankfully, possibly that is unlikely to happen. But uh, unfortunately, though, also, if you see how many Ugandans, you know, uh, um, continue to kneel for them, maybe that might mm. possibly happen, except it will not be uh, with the mandate of, of, of my Jesus. I think it's actually such a, an unfortunate uh, uh, thing that uh, um, that we've ended up in a situation, and I think I think when Albert was talking, I was thinking through other African countries when and how this would happen. You know, um, just as I was joining my career university, I remember... Uh, a very senior police officer in Kenya and going to visit my brother was telling me how extraordinarily strange Ugandans are when it comes to us picking on who should be our leaders, regardless of the kind of mandates that they get and how they come into power. And looking back, I can't believe that since then to date, we've had one man and now one man and his family. And now side by side with that is that uh, the Kampala that UPC planned for with a part of what they call the Greater Kampala Plan, of the late 60s, which included uh, uh, projects that would have included both the Northern Bypass, Southern Bypass, mainly Kampala Orbital going around and around. As I say, the city then that was planned with the massive uh, 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 public housing and constructions where nearly all civil servants had access to public houses, the kind of thing that would happen in places, including the public house that I ended up living in in, in 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 London while I was working for a public organization uh, 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 you know, happening here in Uganda. How we plan for health services across the country. How we plan for educational institutions across the country. How we plan to in, in, and invest it in agriculture as the backbone of our national economy. How we plan including building hotels but linking it side by side with then our tourism uh, industry that we knew was a major forex honor for, for, for the future. How environmentally we thought and structured and how as part of community development, we had government providing that those days, not tweets of today, but community um, um, television shows, public television shows in every sub-county field, you know, uh, free once a month, meaning you get education or you get information. At the time, you just imagine that fast forward to what it would be today, meaning what a government would be able to do for its citizens really across the, the structural divide. That is dead. But as I said, side by side with that, we've got a country which is basically uh, under culture. Yes, we can only discuss this because it's confirming to us the um, the, the, the threat that beyond Museveni, uh, Museveni is imposing members of his family by force militarily. And what is it that we can do? Uh, I know it's difficult to treat uh, away from that in terms of the alternative to I mean, the, the manner in which we're able to, to deal with this going forward. Miriam had talked about um, the, the North American Association uh, event which is taking place there. Maybe this is for you guys in North America, 
uh, should be an opportunity for this conversation to begin, that we have sensible Ugandans, some of whom went abroad in exile, a very good core initial group went into exile, you know, running away from these NRA bandits. Mm -hmm. The next lot became uh, economic migrants, then people who things started getting harder for them and uh, started going out, particularly in the Americas at the time. And fast forward only in the last 10, 15, possibly 20 years, when people started now migrating, either partly going for for scholarships to get in and study, and many other others, and others now beginning to follow families in terms of resettlement. We, on this uh, our, our network, mm. focus as a diaspora show. I think the Ugandan diaspora, this is the opportunity, this is the time for Ugandan diaspora to begin looking into their own faces, seeing what is able and possible in Washington, seeing what is able and possible in Ottawa, seeing what is able and possible in, in, in Toronto and indeed in, in London, and seeing what happens in, uh, in, um, in, um, in Oslo and uh, indeed in um, um, uh, cities across the world, particularly in Western countries. And ask ourselves as citizens of this country, the res this country, resident in those places, knowing very well that the likes of the Trumps will, and if they came, ever came to power, abuse us the way they're doing it. Looking at the protests taking place in UK the other day and asking ourselves that, you know what, the only country we call home is this Republic of Uganda. So that people begin again to re reflect, re reflect, including those ones who now sing Nyongo Nyongo NRA in some of those convention, conventions, thinking that Uganda is glory. But they went there partly because they couldn't sustain themselves in Uganda. We should be able to have this conversation. Yeah. Phil, what am I saying? I'm saying that yeah. maybe going forward, the Ugandans who know that you can manage corruption in another way. Ugandans who know that it's actually possible to have better. And some of the Ugandans outside who can sit with Phil and travel to Chinoni and, and travel to Mbirizi and persuade ordinary average Ugandans that it's possible for us to turn around this country. Backed by people in the diaspora, we need to begin to do so. Because why? If we do so much more critically, Mr. Musevena and his son and his wife and his brother and that family, you know, will realize that no, However much arms they have, meaning military arms, however much they control our exchequer, they cannot be the majority of the people. Then, in any case, anyway, as uh, 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 Albert said, you know, Albert can't be God. This God that they're taking for granted is also my God. That God is the God of the majority of Ugandans, whereas that God is looking elsewhere like God did it to the children of Israel. No, after 40 years, God can actually say, no, enough is enough. Young man, return to wherever you came for us, we don't want to go and line them in Luzira unless they're pushing us to those extremes. But we simply say that, no, they should stop taking this country uh, for granted. But yes, people, my colleagues and friends in the diaspora, maybe this is the time for us to say, no, enough is enough. And any of us who are associated with the NRA who are voting with seven, we should also be able to examine our conscience. Well, thank you so much. That's rather powerful and uh, interesting at the same time. Uh, I want to bring in... Uh, Mr. Albert, you see, the conversations we have here now involving uh, the, the different countries and how things are playing out, I want you to, I want to address you to the recent election in Rwanda. And uh, we had the incumbent, President Paul Kagame, win that election with a majority of 99.15%. That is something you don't see quite of, often in the world. 99.1% of the vote, that means the, almost the entire country was in agreement that President Kagame is the best option for that country. And uh, when we talk relations between Uganda and Rwanda, the interaction at family level, but also the fact that we're heading to elections in 2026, what is your general reaction to that uh, election, but also what can it tell us of what is coming in 2026? My, my general reaction, and, and this uh, may or may not get me in trouble, is <laughs> the, the, the president of Rwanda knows that this is not sustainable. He, he knows that. But just like Uganda, I don't know what the motivation is for these people, man. These are supposed to be very smart people. I mean, I, I've never been one to underestimate them. Seven is brilliance and strategy, strategic thinking. 
if if he was not that brilliant, he wouldn't have been ruling Uganda all this wrong. And Kagame mm. seems to be following in the same footsteps. Where I uh, what I bemoan about their their, their leadership uh, systems, their the systems they put in place, is that these systems have also killed institutions. And if you don't let institutions thrive, at some point they'll come up that they will actually be the same institutions that you would need or your kids or your grandkids would have needed. So I'll bring it back to Uganda and the level that we're talking about. I won't even respond or give time to the, the, the tweets because honestly, it, like, like uh, Miriam said, <laughs> for us, that's nonsense. I, I've lived in the U.S. for almost 30 years. I don't even know who the, the, the Joint Chief of Staff is at the moment. I mean, I can get you the answer. I'll have to Google it. Okay, because they do their job. Okay, they have they have uh, uh, orders. They have things happening that they, they, they demands their attention. Right now, they, their cruise ships are, are 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 racing towards the Middle East to to to, to make sure <laughs> that region doesn't erupt. That's what mm -hmm. they're supposed to do. Okay, so I don't I wouldn't give time to that. But what I said earlier still stands. And this again, uh, to, to our uh, Honorable's um, uh, submission, this again shows you the effects of when you have, you're running a country as a family, I mean, uh, as, as a family. Because when family um, conflicts arise, they're played out on the national scene. But they have real life consequences. Earlier, I mentioned about the organization that uh, Audrey Wabogo leads. Mm. They were here in Washington. They even invited me to, to one of their uh, co 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 um, seminars or presentations, whatever it is. And they were here also begging the U.S. government uh, to, to re-enlist them in Agoa that, because the, the event has been kicked out. Mm. So if I am an American official and I'm meeting Ruabogo and uh, he's uh, talking on behalf of the government of Uganda about how Agoa should be reinstated and these uh, programs give us this, so please look at this differently, don't dwell so much on the homosexuality load, blah, blah, blah. And then I turn on my, tw my, my, my Twitter or X because I follow Ugandan politics that my portfolio. And then I read the son's <laughs> tweet. What do you think, even if it's you in that position as an American official, white or black, it doesn't matter, because in Uganda, you think, oh, those white people. No, it could actually be an African or Ugandan. If you were there, how much attention do you give to what Wabogo is saying? If the son is saying he's a thief, and <laughs> what, what, what am I supposed to do as an American official? Looking at you, negotiating with you, you're the head, one heading uh, delegation of Uganda. Your honorable, uh, your excellence, the ambassador has presented you, and I'm supposed to, to negotiate with you. What said you? Ignore. <laughs> but well, ignore has consequences for Uganda. Yeah. Because I, I won't listen to you. Because if the person who knows you better, the family member of yours is calling you a thief. So ignore causes Uganda <laughs> consequences. Then I will not listen to Uganda's position. I will not listen to Uganda's appeal. And that causes us, our country to continue suffering. Right? So, yeah. And again, here in this country, and I know we'll get to that topic earlier, you asked about us to apprise you of what is happening. Here in this country, just like in Canada, we're going to have elections this year. Yes, November. And, and, and I have to tell you that in, in, in my observing the Uganda-American relations, this is going to be the fifth time Uganda is backing a loser in the American elections. <laughs> in wow. 2007, I was here. The president of Uganda came here and his people, they made uh, arrangements and they met with John McCain 
who was running against Obama, they did not mm -hmm. even bother. They did not even bother to meet with Obama or his people. And Obama never forget, 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 forget them for that. So the relationship between Uganda and the U.S. during Obama's administration was at best frost because of that miscalculation. Fast forward to 2016, same scenario. The government of Uganda had backed Hillary, as, as the rest of the world did, uh, to be fair. In January, it was Trump being sworn in. 2020, oh, everybody was so sure Trump was going to stay, so they, they, they didn't change anything. They started appealing to Trump through this, the homosexual laws and all that kind of stuff, thinking that they would get some favors. They were wrong. Biden became the president. Now, all this summer, and you hear to the tweets that, oh, he wants to, to, to meet with Elon Musk and Trump, because all this summer, the polls had Trump beating Biden. And that's where the Ugandan government has been, making overtures to, to Christian fundamentalists, and even things that should not be done overtly. But they've been doing them, including the tweets that you're talking about. I can tell you, and they've been good, a good student of American politics. Kamala Harris will be the next president of the U.S. Okay, you cannot run against a movement. And again, this will be the fifth time Uganda is backing a loser in the U.S. politics because they do not understand the workings of this government. They do not work. I, I think it was well, uh, Dr. Court, uh, one time we were, I asked a question on one of the similar shows I asked, does Uganda or Ugandan institutions, do they have a course on Am American studies? And I think the answer was no. Well, yeah. I don't know, maybe you could correct me, Philip, if you know of any university in Uganda that offers yeah. American studies. If so the answer is no, it's a disservice. And this, again, even goes back to our mm -hmm. conversation about the, the, the ambassador to Canada. It's like our people do not understand how America works. This place is imperfect. This place has its inequalities. This place, but the systems have a different way of working. And if you don't understand them, you're going to run afoul of the law like uh, the, the, the Honorable Ambassador is in Canada. <laughs> or you're going to end up backing a loser or this and that. Things that don't help Uganda. So again, I we'll wrap this up, going back to the conversation about the, the, these stupid tweets and, 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 and they don't help because for Americans here, they don't want to be talking to a court, Dr. Court, if they don't think Dr. Court has the ear of the president, if they want something from the president of Uganda. Okay. So when you send uh, somebody who is powerless <laughs> and they say, ask now, because uh, yes, they do work for the government, but yes, I'm a Ugandan American. You, you can't change that. But yeah, when, because, uh, yes, uh, um, the Honorable said we as the diaspora should be looking at Uganda, but we've, we've left a long time ago. And to be fair, our country, our motherland has abandoned us. And even the, the, the organization that we're talking about, you know, that would be really a think tank to some, have some mm -hmm. of these. It's, it doesn't work that way. The, the government hijacked it a long time ago. Yes. It's now yes. an extension of the NRM government. Yes. Yes. The, those conversations of intellectuals that you think are happening, they don't. Okay. As a matter of fact, the intellectuals that I, that I know, I've stopped coming. I don't, I'm not disparaging the organization. Trust me. It's in my neighborhood, and if you I was might. not, I, I would go. But the people, the doctors, the lawyers, the, the, the people, they're no longer participating in you. Now it's, 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 it's a party uh, uh, circus. Yeah. Okay, you, we go there, you meet friends. Uh, I'll, I'll go on Friday. I was yeah. even talking earlier with uh, Miriam. When are you coming? Go on Friday. On Friday, I'll live here. I'll go in the lobby. we get a drink. we catch out. And that's it. But that talk about true. conversations, true. constructive conversations, constructive conversations about our the future of our country and any of that. Those conversations stopped a long time ago. Yeah. And they be yeah. reignited? Maybe. But maybe the Phelps of this world and the younger generation can. But some of us are running out of time. We've grew, we have gray hair. Yeah. Uh, so we actually now are beginning to think of ourselves. Uh, 
that maybe we may not even go back to Uganda. Our kids are here, our wives are here, our homes are here. <laughs> Uganda has not given us an olive branch to say, you guys come, everything. Where are my, my, my kids going to, to, to live next to Kitezi? So if these are the stories we're having, you know, why would they even think of Uganda as a place when they have Florida, London, and other places to, to, to stay? These are global kids. Okay. So, so Uganda has not thought of that. Of that. Then... Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Yeah, thank so I'll you. wrap it with that. Thank you, <laughs> Philip. Thank you, Albert. Um, it's rather unfortunate that, that that's how things are turning out to be. But uh, our time is uh, quickly spent. I want to bring in uh, Dr. Court here briefly about oh. this particular issue. And uh, I listened to that quite painfully. But we are heading into 2026. We saw an election in, in the neighborhood, 99%. The inauguration happened uh, a few days ago. Over 20 African presidents in attendance, vice presidents, prime ministers. Almost the entire continent was at a standstill because there was an inauguration somewhere. And we seem not to see such things happening outside. You don't see in the United States when uh, a president is being inaugurated, you don't see the entire Europe in, uh, at that function. Or in Europe, you don't see seem to see all these other presidents in place. Uh, what is your general reaction to all these things? Yeah, thank you so much, Afro. Uh, permit me, before I answer that, to just comment briefly on um, some of the submissions by uh, Albert. I want to say uh -huh. that uh, I do concur with Albert uh, 100%. Uh, the current, uh, you know, the Uganda North American kind of uh, entity has been hijacked uh, by the status quo. And uh, indeed, uh, most Ugandans uh, in North America don't even think of it. I think I last attended one of the students, uh, went for one of the students, that was the last one, I think 206 around there, that was in uh, Seattle here. And uh, that time at the peak, the Northern War, and their agenda, even they didn't even put on the agenda about Africa country that was facing war. They were just there trying to be little, become so political, and since then I've never gone back. So it doesn't you know, kind of represent, uh, you know, uh, the needs and uh, the desires of uh, Ugandans back home. Uh, it's merely a political wing of the ruling party. And uh, another party, you know, others are good intention. You go there, you can meet your fellow countrymen and women, but um, I, I don't expect much as a person. So I won't be going, actually, yeah. So um, thank you. Uh, back to uh, to your question about Rwanda. You know, I kind of commented here in the last uh, kind of uh, session we had here that mm. it's very interesting that um, you know uh, it's excellent Sikagame can obtain ninety nine percent, you know, <laughs> of the of, of the votes. Honestly, mm. you know, that for me is a little bit uh, interesting. You know, uh, I, I don't know he's, uh, he's a strong leader. He's a strong uh, uh, leader. He has done tremendous uh, uh, things on the ground. You know, uh, Kigali is very clean and uh, the economy is fairly, you know, functioning. You know, infrastructure, you know, is shining. You know, is a very good tourist attraction. You know, he has uh, built a very strong military, you know, and... Um, he has kind of also kind of uh, to some degree shaped on corruption tendencies, you know, in the country. I give him a, a pat on the back on that. He has uh, fairly tried from the social, economic, environmental uh, perspectives, okay? Get me right. But when it comes mm. to the political uh, aspect of things, I think it's wanting there, you know? He has done other areas so well, but the political piece is really wanting. Why? Because uh, there are no uh, platforms for those with alternative voices to express themselves uh, freely without any, you know, without uh, with a fear of being uh, followed or persecuted. Okay, mm -hmm. find most of the most of the outspoken and uh, uh, serious politicians have taken off the outside of the country. Some in Canada here, you meet some in Canada here, in, in London, they're there, they're out. You know, so there's no any kind of uh, serious uh, competition, okay, on the ground. It's a suffocated uh, kind of uh, political uh, environment, 
And uh, by the fact that you can see that uh, dozens and dozens of, uh, you know, African heads of state and prime ministers and, uh, you know, uh, ministers are going to uh, uh, go and uh, condone and enjoy such kind of uh, uh, event of swearing in is a clear, you know, indication that uh, as a continent, we have a, a problem, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, even goes further to say that uh, like the AU, the African Union, the East African uh, Corporation, the SADC, these are, these are platforms, all these are clubs of business, mm -hmm. autocrats, you know, who we'll get together, you know, and toss glasses of champagne and wine, celebrate by keeping power at, at any at any level, whether through hook or crook, they want to keep you know, power, you know. So they go that endorse, you know, to sanitize, you know, the false or actual victories of their colleagues, you know. In a real world, do you can you get ninety nine percent, and then uh, two other uh, countering uh, political entities get one percent, share that. You know, I don't. I don't even win. You say sixty-five, <coughs> seventy. You know, seventy-five. I would say okay, but ninety-nine percent, to some degree, there's something wanting there. So I'm not very much into that. But I must say, as I said before, that uh, NPF and Kagame have registered some tremendous, you know, uh, kind of progress in uh, the social, the economic, mm. and environmental aspect. Okay. They have fairly functioning institutions, okay? Compared like, to Uganda, compared to Uganda. At least they have a very strong kind of uh, anti corruption platforms. If you're um, corrupt and you're good, there are severe consequences, okay? They're military. They are well kind of shaped and they're disciplined. Uh, the civil services, they are clearly kind of tuned, you know? There are no nuances around there. So is a kind of uh, a strong man, but is that the most sustainable way or model of leadership? No. In the absence of uh, Kagame, can that kind of uh, situation hold? It might not. There are other classical yeah. examples. Look here, just mm -hmm. like Libya under Gaddafi. Gaddafi was a great guy, you know. It is just that tremendous uh, kind of uh, success in the social, economic, environmental, you know, there were institutions like the scholarly, you know, education. Yeah, even the Pan-Africanist uh, aspect. I was a student, we benefited. We had the RCM, what called the Revolutionary Movement, Committee Movement. Mm -hmm. They were funded by Gaddafi. We had an office in, uh, you know, in, down, in Kampala. We had the Green the Greenpeace, Gaddafi. So he was there, but again, he had a gap where at the political front, there were no competition. It was the alpha and omega, and that was a problem, and that's what brought him down. So I can see, you know, future challenges and contradictions, whether in uh, post Kagame or even before. Is that sustainable in the next 30 years? Unless it mentors and, uh, you know, it transfers power and maybe from the back, like uh, the way Julius Nedra did, you know, he was at the back as a chairman, and there was kind of a, a president to make sure that thing might you not know, kind of move on smoothly when he's still there. Even, even Uganda, you assume tomorrow, you know, our leader is not there. What will be the vacuum? You know, there are so many bulls in the kraal. So these are uh, issues that we as Africans should be worried about. We need institutions. Not in the end, not the Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Miriam, 99% yeah. 2026 ahead, uh, coming in. Many of the political opponents, some in prison, some in exile, the other two that were allowed to contest less than 1% to share. What does that tell you about uh, the progress of this region? uh it's uh it's unfortunate like uh, um, uh for us who are interested in democracy i mean he didn't get to 99 percent today he, uh I'm, I'm reading here like he had 
93% in 2003, uh, 2008 he had 93%, uh, 2015 he had 98%, uh, 2017, I mean he's, he's been having 90 plus and um, he is also has ha, is one of the leaders who has had most, if not all, his opponents in prison, some dead. And he is also Rwanda is one of the countries which has majority of its citizens in exile, even up today. Yeah. It's also one of the country which has ever been fighting its neighborhoods because it's I mean it cannot have like uh a great neighbor uh, friendliness, like it's always in conflict and it survives by chaos. So he has the numbers, but we, we all know how they get the numbers. I mean, Gaddafi got the numbers, Bashir would get the numbers, Mo, uh, Mubarak, uh, uh, that Egyptian guy who was kicked out had the numbers. Mm -hmm. The moment you see anything above 80%, the moment you see such uh, abnormal numbers, you know that that country is in a uh, the people are really suffocated and they can't express themselves. That's common sense. But uh, the biggest unfortunate part about um, the Rwanda and the continuity of President Kagame is that he looks to be functioning. Like Ochen has highlighted a few things that are all that clear, the, the, the garbage maybe is corrected, and like in Kampala, and um, they, they try to fight corruption. It's all like a whitewash. It's like a kilograph kind of a system just to doing you that they have something going on. And also, Rwanda, uh, I, I, uh, as Africans, as Pan-Africans, we really have an issue with Rwanda because it's one of the imperial agent countries which was assisting UK and other and other imperial agendas in deporting African immigrants from UK and trying to resettle them in Rwanda. It's um, anything for money. You know, Kagame is anything for money, anything for power. And that is, that is so sad. That's so unfortunate. That is, if today you ask any, any I mean, Uganda looks shabby on all circles like the politics the the systems the infrastructure everything we look really shabby now on the diplomatic side but if you ask a ugandan and the rwandese in diaspora a person who is ready to go back home anytime the ugandan would be packing their suitcase and ready to go back but the rwandese some of them can't even land in their country I have I know a friend yesterday who was traveling uh, from here and he was going back to Uganda, not to Rwanda because the parents are in exile in Uganda and they never went back home. He was he was stranded because his plane uh, uh, made a, a stopover in Chigari instead of coming through uh, either Nairobi or Kampala dialect, Entebbe dialect. So they can't even step in that country. So that is that shows what Rwanda is. It's like that um, uh, nice, clean. Uh, I mean, there are these cobras. I, I used to to, to be a, a farming girl. I'm old, I'm, old, I'm a village girl, and I would keep cattle in the in the farms. And the the more decorated kind of like lizards were, the more um, poisonous. That's kind wow. of for you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but that's a deep one. Thank you so much for that uh, overview of what your opinion is about the government the entire way things are run in that particular country. Our colleagues, our time is very much fast spent. We, we have about five minutes to close out on this episode. I will uh, invite you to really give us your final remarks on the subjects, the Kites incident, and how you see Uganda and by extension the region and the continent moving forward in terms of uh, leadership, in terms of planning, in terms of organization and management. Uh, I will start with, uh, let me start with Honorable Chen. Honorable, briefly. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, Phil, thank you. I think you, you omitted my contributions on that. You forgot that I'm Kagame's earliest best friend. <laughs> but uh, because of time, yes, I will basically summarize it in this way, but uh, I'll conclude with Kagame. One very quickly for 30 seconds. Uh, Museveni and this bunch basically did not support Barack Obama for a very specific reason. It's shame on them. It's obviously true that the earliest uh, 
the guys that were saving the sent abroad were spies to spies on us, egg sellers at the time. So many of them were not particularly very smart people anyway, and I'll say that deliberately. And but number two, that later when it came now to analyzing out of can see this in UK and other places. Um, I mean, I mean, obviously I was ahead of the external operation for Uganda People's Congress politically, <laughs> diplomatically, and others. So I have an idea. Uh, and so when UNA came up, you know, we saw UNA as a, a hope and a possibility, particularly it was because it was predominantly uh, uh, organized by communities from in the central and to limited, limited extent to the West. We thought these guys were relatively established and, 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 and so it would give it a, a, a fantastic foundation for, for our diaspora community. But also at the same time, it was as early as that time, maybe the first or second uh, 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 summit that it became very clearly the case that uh, it was almost like an organized launch for Comrade Kaguta. One of the reasons why I never attended any, by the, as a matter of interest, for the record. As early as that time, it was the case that um, it was possibly not in my interest uh, to step in on, on, on those, those, those forums. So it's a little, a little bit of a shame. So when I was raising it, I was raising it in part to challenge the diaspora, but also maybe to challenge even people who've used this organization to examine their conscience to turn to turn around. But as I said for Obama, it was very deliberate, very political, and very not Ugandan American, but I will not go into the details for them. And yes, of course, they fundamentally have got that very wrong. As far as um, Kaguta, Kagame versus Rwanda is concerned, very quickly, I just want to say that um, <coughs> Excuse me. The only, I'm really sorry. The only advantage, the, the only thing that you can give Kagame credit to is that unlike his mentor, Mr. Museveni, um, you know, and unlike him, Museveni, and uh, if you put Gaddafi, this is all this a bunch of dictators, by the way. All this a bunch of dictators, nothing else. They're not good guys. Gaddafi was not a good guy. Gaddafi was just a dictator who was opportunistic. But yes, he served his people. And in many other cases, he did quite a few what good things we can, but he was a dictator. This is a guy who sustained Idi Amin in this country. This is a man whom we had to fight for information. Feel you're a younger one, you know, after 1979. It was Gaddafi who remained side by side with Idi Amin. So if we hadn't defeated the bunch with Idi Amin, we would not be talking some of this conversation. It's a shame, Mr. Museven, for another very strategic, opportunistic reason, using um, um, Gaddafi's people, including the, the Moses Ali's, to go ahead and mobilize the port and then the gun break up was next in Luweda. So my quick point is this. The difference between Kagame and Museveni is that while in Kampala, we have a primitive Bush family dictatorship, in Rwanda, interestingly, we have a rather relatively smart dictatorship that sort of seems to use Rwanda as a sample. So Kagame can control Rwanda and, uh, and own it 100%, but does Rwanda in his image and does quote something for Rwanda. In Uganda, we have a Museveni who will do everything for Museveni, his family, and any other patronage followers. You can survive and do whatever else you do, so long as you do not compromise the family of uh, Mr. Museveni and Museveni's interests. In Libya you. and many other places, yes, you will uh, not threaten uh, uh, Gaddafi or, uh, 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 or um, CC's power, uh, but you know, in a way, so long as uh, Libya or Egypt remains sustainable. For my seven, it does not matter. Thank That's you. the difference. Thank you, Honorable Chenna, for that uh, submission, and thank you indeed for giving us those amazing views. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable, and thank you, Philip. Uh, so I want to start with the tail end of uh, the Honorable submission. Uh, yes, all these things are happening, but I think this is an opportunity. It is an, it's not too late, and I had this some um, conversation uh, yeah. with... with, with um, uh, Honorable Mao in Dallas uh, last year when he was talking about um, how if we don't get this right, there will be bloodshed when transition comes. And mm. I asked him, I was like, okay, how about you stop digging the hole, the hole we are in? Because they say when you're in a hole and you intend to get out, you stop digging. Yeah. How about right now, the government changes course? Free all the political prisoners that they have in there. Stop this nonsense. Stop this looting. It's not really too late. Too late. You can mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. cut the costs. You can start working for the people. You can do some of the infra infrastructures. People already have... How much money do you need? The people, they have stolen. They will need mm -hmm. them. So how much money do you need? So at what point do you say, you know what? Fine. Okay, fine. Let's start over. So th that really is 
my, my thinking about this. And then on the, the diaspora mm -hmm. community, like I said, people who are listening to me maybe for the first time or who land upon this um, contribution might think, oh, we're just lamenting. No. Some of us actually, I think it was 2020, 2019, we got a group of intellectuals and we decided, okay, let's go and decide to run UNA. The government poured in money, the sleeper cells woke up, and our, our <laughs> death cells were sent to the state house, and they literally ran us out of the organization. I was the deputy speaker for them for two years, uh, 2019, 2021. 2021, we collected a group of, of, of really experts. I'm talking about people. I mean, I don't consider myself up there, but for God's sake, the government of the U.S. pays me a lot of money to be a budget officer. But, you know, would, would, would not let me... <laughs> look at their budget <laughs> i'm like you gotta be kidding me <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that they've taken over the organization handed it over yeah. to people who really can't do anything uh, and keep it as a political organization and maybe that serves them now but of course it does deny the broader impact of the community because really this should be yeah. a thing it could there should be knowledge transfer happening right now between the doctors and the lawyers and all the other professionals that we have here and the Ugandans. This stuff that we're talking about of garbage disposals, almost every major city in the U.S. is run by African-Americans. And for most African-American, uh, uh, for most Ugandan professionals, because of the systematic racism in, in, in this place, you actually would find them in those places. Mm -hmm. You would actually find them as engineers, as in this, in those places, because that's where they gravitated towards their own kind. If you come here, if if if, if a mayor of Kampala came here, I don't even think it will be a hassle for me, me, a, a little little person. I don't think it will be a hassle to introduce him to 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 to, to, the, uh, to the, maybe the mayor of this of, of this place or to because yeah. he's, he's he's an African American. And I'm a voter in his in, in his area. I voted him. I cannot go to his office and he locks me out. I can all easily go to say I've brought Dr. Court, he's the mayor of Kampala. We're trying to do a, um, uh, to, to make a comparison here. Maybe he's doing some benchmarking. This is his delegation. I'm going to facilitate that meeting. <laughs> so so that should be what is happening with the knowledge knowledge transfer with our experts here. But the, the NIM government killed that. Now the organization is just, like I said, it's a party and it's about to happen and uh, Miriam is coming and we're going <laughs> to be <embrace. laughs> But the interview guys, man. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Uh, Dr. Gott, briefly. Uh, thank you so much. I'll be very uh, concise. Uh, I do concur with most all the sentiments uh, colleagues have uh, expressed and um, I must say that uh, I'm in North America, but uh, I, I lose nothing by not, uh, you know, going for that. But uh, I do wish uh, my other fellow compatriots, you know, uh, you know, to have a great time and uh, and fun, um, because I know that in terms of uh, the issues that will be discussed there, they will not go mm. far because of other, you know, kind of extraneous interests that have are kind of compromised. Yeah, the. The credibility of that uh, editing. So um, that is my position. And uh, secondly, about uh, the TC kind of uh, issue, the environmental disaster that took place uh, back in um, Kampala, of course, uh, that's in Amin uh, in, um, in uh, Kus Kampala, uh, is very unfortunate. But I think uh, there are a lot of stuff that can be done, and uh, it's never too late. There are some mm -hmm. highlights I would uh, suggest that, uh, you know, the landfills need to be closed. You know, there's no need to, you know, to keep on, uh, you know, keeping that place. The landfills should be closed and uh, transformed into, you know, some uh, other, you know, productive, uh, you know, resource. It's possible. It's done elsewhere. But from the environmental point of view, it can be done because it's very clear that uh, it, it has come a very kind of environmental uh, boom in that area. And if they continue staying there, we shall witness even the worst than what we have seen right now. And I also appeal to the government and other, you know, uh, 
non-profit uh, organizations and uh, the civil societies to come forward and help the victims try to you know, provide uh, psychosocial uh, support and um, rehabilitation and so on. Yeah, that is very important. Then as we also head to, uh, you know, 20, I think 26 or elections around the corner. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know that, uh, you know, the ground is not that kind of leveled, but uh, I would uh, appeal to other Ugandans who are yearning for change and the alternative voices should uh, consider, you know, galvanizing themselves and look at the bigger picture to bring in uh, some progressive, uh, you know, regime uh, change in a, in a more democratic way. It's doable if uh, Ugandans uh, who want to see change get together because it's overdue. Yeah, and this is a time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Court, for those views. And I think they're quite amazing. And Miriam, finally, briefly. Uh, I would like to thank you, Philip, uh, for the good moderation and the, my fellow panelists. I, thank you so much for those enlightening uh, ideas. I hope someone took note. And I want to pass on my condolences to the today's people. But I think we are like kind of tired of these condolences and then the president sending in Posho whatever to bury the dead and the stories are buried alongside that. I hope to see heads rolling. I hope to see people held accountable. I, I would like to see some reforms at KCCA, especially how managing, how managing the authority and reconciling it with the, uh, the council, the political and the administrative. I would like to see better and um, some changes in waste management in Uganda. If you really go to any place, be it Nagasello Market, Nachivu Channel. I mean, Uganda is like, Kampala is like a garbage city. If you, it's either potholes and the dust and then the garbage downtown. And then, I mean, either it's floods and the, 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 the infectious diseases will be up and infecting people everywhere. It's time we get out of that cycle. It's time we get out of that mess. And if the president can't do anything, I, I, I think anybody, everybody can do their part at their local posts. If the KCCA can do something, if each mayor can do something in their own city, if uh, uh, young people like Philip can talk because you are not yet even in positions of power. And please, like uh, Ochen has said, rise up keep moving the gen z's go up and take over some spaces which you can occupy participate in the politics i know uh when we talk of 2026 people are pessimistic we don't even have a sound electoral commission to talk about i mean how can we even have a transparent elections but we keep we keep hoping we just hope for ugandans and that's what keeps us going but we can do better like albert said it shouldn't stop at lamenting we can do a lot better if we really, if the channels which are there are not working, if the roads are closed, let's open some panya somewhere until we get where we are going. And as Thank for you, Yuna, yeah, uh, we will meet you, Albert, I'm going to see you there. But <laughs> again, that show... I am jealous. <laughs> I hope you could join us. At least we can share some muchomo and a few more things <laughs> around, you know. But it shows, it shows like the, how that organization was vibrant and how NRM hijacked it and destroyed it. It goes along with shows how either our president Museven doesn't wish anything thriving for Uganda, or he's totally so greedy that he doesn't want to see anything that might challenge him, and in effect kills whatever else is uh, coming up under his face, under his eyes. But that organization was destroyed by NRM. And as people in diaspora, Albert, we, 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 we can do better. We've, we have been surrounded by activists who can fight and destroy segregation, racism. Why can't we rise up? We can do something about it. So don't give up yet. You can still participate. And if you not doesn't work, we will create something else which works. Thank you so much, um, Miriam Chomgasho, for those amazing views and for making time to be on this conversation. Uh, 
Honorable Joseph Pacheno, thank you so much for the views and for making time to join the conversation. Mr. Albert Lakasara, thank you so much for your amazing views and for making time for the conversation. And lastly, Dr. Koto Chen, thank you so much for the amazing views and for making time for the conversation. A special thanks to you, our viewers out there, for making time to listen to the views that the gentlemen and ladies here have to put out there, but also we call upon whoever is in position to effect any changes for the, the discussions we have, the challenges and how we can make things better, please do something because this is our country, it is our motherland and it is our duty to make it a better place for us. Special thanks to Africa and the Center for Constitutional Governance for putting this together and from us we say good evening and may you have freedom. Thank Always. you so much.